So I've been in ministry about 30 seconds, and it was uh, my very first day on staff at a, at, at a church. And I get, uh, I get a call on my phone, and I missed it because I was teaching a, uh, a, a second and third grade Sunday school class on the playground. And then all of a sudden, the guy that hired me came out of the middle. He was supposed to be preaching, but he came out in the middle of the service, and he said, hey, Chris, I just need to know one thing. Are you willing to drive someone? And I said, yes. Yes, I am. And he said, okay, great. Pull up your car to the front of the school, which is where we were having this, uh, uh, where we were having our church service. And, uh, and then somebody will come out. And I said, okay, great. And so I did that. I pulled out my car. And then the whole time I'm thinking, ah, what's going on? Is this weird? Do I have enough gas in my tank? I couldn't tell. Uh, and I wanted to just kind of, uh, it was, a, it, there was a lot going through my mind. And then all of a sudden, this, uh, this doctor who comes out of, uh, of the front doors of the school, but she's, going, she's coming with someone. And uh, I heard them coming before I saw them coming because what I heard was blood curdling screams. And I didn't know what was going on at all. Uh, but then I looked to a very, very pregnant woman uh, who was in labor and about to deliver a baby. And then my mind starts racing more and more and more saying, I, I really hope I have enough gas in the tank <laughs> at this moment. And the doctor comes out and she says, um, okay, Chris, what I'm going to do. She's so calm. She says, okay, Chris, um, I just, I need you to, uh, um, I need you to be able to drive about 120 miles an hour. And I was like, Yes, ma'am. I, I will do this thing. I don't know who uh, this is that the laws obey you, but I'm in. Whatever you tell me, ma'am, I'm in. Let's do this. Uh, and so she was like, okay, I need you to run this red light. And I was like, yes, ma'am, I will do this thing. Put on your hazard. It was great. The whole time I'm freaking out. This lady is screaming in the back, ah, which is making me scream in the back, in the front. Ah, it's freaking out. There's a lot going on. I was thinking, please don't have this baby in my car. Maybe it would have added value to the car. I'm not sure. We get there. And it's all I can talk about for the rest of my time at this church. And why do I tell you that story? Because it was the highlight of my ministry time there. Day one, I got to ride with a doctor on her mission to save life and bring life into the world. And today, I want to issue the same call to us. We have a beautiful invitation from the maker of the world who is on a mission to save lives and bring life into the world. And the only question is, the same question that my pastor came out in the middle of the sermon and asked me, are you willing to go on the ride? And it's a simple yes or no. So I want to go ahead and give you the altar call um, at the beginning of the message to put your unreserved yes on the table. To put your unreserved yes on the table. God gave uh, invitations uh, like this throughout the Gospels. He, he called the disciples and he, he asked them a question, would you follow me? And they gave them their yes. And we're going to pick up in, a, in just a portion of scripture, seeing what this mission to save life and bring life into the world that Jesus was on, inviting people with him, inviting us with him. We're going to see what that looks like here. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter nine. This is kind of at the height of Jesus's ministry. He's on an incredible mission. He has been uh, in the mainstream of life. He's done some incredible things. He, he, he's seen uh, people be healed uh, of their sickness. He's raised people from the dead. He's taken uh, deaf people and made them hear. He's taken lame people and made them jump for joy. He's taken blind people and restored their sight. And these 12 ordinary everyday men that he issued the call to early on and just said, would you come with me on this mission? And they said, yes, too. They have been witness to an incredible, incredible ministry opportunity. 
So Matthew chapter nine, verse 35 is where we'll start. And it says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease, every affliction. He's seen incredible things happen. And Jesus is going through and he's teaching, but he's, he's not only just teaching. There's a lot of times where we see, we see things like this. Uh, that's what a lot of ministry looks like today, where people are up on, in, in front of a stage. Uh, but Jesus is not only doing that, but he's also going into the mainstream of everyday life. He's teaching uh, not only just in synagogues, but he's teaching in the marketplaces. He, he's touching people. He's healing in one-on-one close moments. God's ministry, Jesus's ministry wasn't just main stage, but it was also mainstream. It wasn't just up front, but it was also up, up close. When he says the kingdom of God was at hand, it's almost like he was like reaching out and touching because he did. There's a lot that's going on. And in verse 36, Jesus looks out and he sees crowds. You see crowds in your life and in your everyday mainstream of life. When you go to the grocery store, you see those crowds. And when Jesus looks out and sees the crowds, he sees them and he has compassion on them. That word compassion is actually, it's actually like a gut wrenching. Um, it, it's a turning of the gut is what the word literally translates into. It's, it's kind of like this, you know, whenever you're like flipping through the commercials and you see like the Sarah McLaughlin, like the, the animals in the arms of an angel, you know, that's all. And you're like, oh, I have to turn this right now or I'm going to like adopt 40 pets. And I just can't do that with my bank account right now. I just can't do that right now. So I need to turn this really, really, really quickly. It's meant to incite this compassion or, uh, or maybe you've seen commercials for a, an organization called Compassion International. And it makes you, the, the heart-wrenching, the, the hurt that you see on the screen, uh, the heart-wrenching, the, the gut-wrenching scene that Jesus is looking out when he, looks at, when he looks out at the crowds and he sees people who are harassed and helpless. And the word harassed there is actually, it's, it's like a filleting of the skin. It's like somebody's like uh, scratching the skin off it. It just hurts. And Jesus looks and sees that and and he's got to do something. See, compassion isn't just sympathy. It's not just being able to drive down and look at like a homeless person down the street and be like, man, that, that hurts me and keep driving. That's just sympathy. But compassion is I have to do something. Jesus always has an action to his compassion, always. He, see, he has compassion on, uh, on a blind person and he heals their sight. He has compassion on a lame person and, and he heals them to where they are walking and jumping for joy. Every time there's an action to Jesus' compassion, except for, except for, except for this passage. He sees the crowds, he has compassion and, and the need is massive. We see this need. We know this need well. There's people in our, in our worlds, maybe, maybe we know it personally. That the divorce that, that's hurting my family right now is tearing us up. It feels like our whole family is being ripped apart. That the phone call that we got last week about, about the family member that has the illness that doesn't have a cure yet. We see this harassed in helplessness. There is an action to, to Jesus' compassion here, but it's different than we would see. When Jesus um, sees the crowds, he has compassion for them because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The action to Jesus is compassion. God's game plan for this lost and a dying world is found in verse 37. And and I just want to bring out a couple things here. And he says to his disciples, God's game plan for a lost and a dying world isn't just the one leader. God's game plan for a lost and dying world is his followers. It's you and I. It's people who are willing to say yes. Uh, 
That's the first thing that we see, God's game plan. What, what, he, what he does is he, imagine with me that you're, that you're walking through and Jesus kind of just takes a step back and he's looking out and the need is so overwhelming, just like we see. And it's like he calls his disciples over. He says, guys, come over close to me. And that's really the first thing that we need to see is, is God's game plan is, is to draw you close to himself, to himself. The greatest thing that you can give this world is, is not the things that you do for God, but your closeness to him. So he calls the disciples closer to himself, draws them near. My, my, I've, got a, I've got a three-year-old. Uh, one of his favorite games to play is, uh, is Barry in the Pillows. And uh, that means we just jump on, on our bed and I just bury him in the pillows and uh, I'm like, avalanche, and he'd just throw all these pillows on him. And then uh, we just do that for hours. And one day uh, we'd done that for hours and I could tell that he was getting tired. And uh, he, I just, I was exhausted because three-year-olds are exhausting. And I like kind of fell out on the bed and then he fell out on the bed on me. And then he, uh, he, he had his head like right here, just really close to my chest. And he said, uh, dad, I can hear your heartbeat. And he was so close to me in that moment. And I noticed something, that it will not be long after you draw close to the heart of Jesus that he will show you what his heart beats for. It is not long after you draw close to Jesus that he'll turn your eyes to the needs of the people around you because that is his heartbeat. It wrenches his gut. And it wrenches ours. God's game plan for our life is, is we're so close to him, the fire of God's love. We say white hot in love with him. And our heart is on fire, but after our heart is on fire, our life will begin to be lived on purpose. Look at it. So in verse 37, Jesus calls the disciples close to himself. And then it's almost like he says, look out. You, you've got my viewpoint. You're, you're standing where I'm standing. Just look. The harvest is plentiful, but, but, the, but the laborers are, are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. God's game plan isn't, isn't just people up here. God's, God's plan for a lost and a dying world isn't, isn't just a man with a microphone, seminary trained or, or whatever. That, that is not the, the, the plan to, to take the massive need of the harvest, which are so re, uh, ready to be, uh, to be picked, to be reaped. God's game plan isn't just one person. Uh, standing in front of a crowd, but it's everyone in here who's willing to say, yes, yes, Lord. Whatever you say, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, whenever you want me to do it, my yes is on the table. That's what a laborer is. Not, not someone to stand up and be a leader, but people who are going to be willing to get into the mud, into the muck, into the mire, into the everyday life. I, I think of... I think of a, a youth pastor that was impactful to me. His name was Greg. He was, he was one of those guys that was like an old youth pastor. Uh, and he tells me uh, about these, um, these, these two guys that was in his youth group a while back. And their names were Crowder and Poe. Crowder and Poe. And uh, but they were like always together. Poe like really kind of loved to share his testimony. Crowder like played a banjo. And so it was just like this like really weird uh, connect, but they were like the clowns of the youth group and all of that stuff. And, and, and Crowder and Poe were just like, they were stuck. They were two peas in a pod. They were always together and they got in trouble a lot, but, uh, but God really started to get a hold of them, even out of passages like, like this. Greg wanted to teach this, this idea that God's 
plan was just everyone in their in, in their fields, wherever their fields would take them, just to say yes to whatever God had for their life. And that might be, uh, that might be a law office, or that might be uh, in a hospital, or that might be on a stage or in a church or uh, whatever that is. That it, wherever the field is, the field may be different, but the harvest is the same. So Crowder and Poe, their hearts begin to, to really grow and, and to, they draw close to God and they begin to live their life on purpose for him. And years down the road, Greg kind of does some research and looks back at, at where Crowder and Poe ended up. And Poe is this, is this um, he owns a bait and tackle shop. <laughs> and, I, and I'm talking with, with uh, their youth pastor, Greg, and Greg is he's so, so, so passionate about, about he's so thankful, so proud of Poe because he, he, he owns, he does a small group in his bait and tack, tackle shop where he takes these guys in Louisiana and uh, they come weekly and they drink coffee and they just, they, they live out their relationship. They, they, they spin their heart. They get, they get their heart on fire together on a weekly basis. And he was so, so proud. And when he was talking uh, with Poe and then he was like, and then I, did some research on Crowder and Crowder kept playing the banjo and Crowder got uh, a little bit famous for that. And now he plays at this huge thing called passion every year. And, and he, he, th this is what struck me that he was just as proud as Poe leading a small group of six men as he was with, with Crowder leading 75,000 people on the stage. Because the, it, at the end of the day, uh, the fields may look different, but the work is the same. The fields may look different, but the work is the same. And I don't know what your work is. I don't know where your field is. I don't know where God will send you out. Imagine that you're just like an arrow. And I don't know what, whenever that arrow lands, I don't know where, what, where that will land, but God has a plan for your life, that your heart on fire for him would lead to a life on purpose for him. That you would put your unreserved yes on the table. And no matter uh, where you go, that you would say, whatever you have for me, yes, Lord. Wherever you want me to go, yes, Lord. Whatever you want me to say, whenever you want me to do it, yes, Lord. That's how, that's how, that's how the, the ride of a lifetime started with me. It was just an unreserved yes. And it's the same for you and I. So I wonder today if, if you are saying, I, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I, I know what I want to do when I, when I get there. I, I, know, I, I know that I'm going to go into the mainstream of life, that there are places, ordinary, everyday places that God just wants me to live my heart on fire for him. And if that's you, I want you to stand. And I want you to say that my, my yes is on the table for him. So I'm going to pray. And after after I pray, I, I want to give you some time to stand and, and, and say the, the sentence, my unreserved yes is on the table for him. So Lord Jesus, whatever you um, tell us to do, yes. Lord, wherever you tell us to go, yes. Whenever you tell us to do it, yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes. Lord, we, we don't want to build our name or a, a kingdom. We, we, our, our kingdom, we want to build yours here on earth. Lord, we see that the harvest is plentiful, but people who are willing to just say yes, to get into the ordinary, everyday, normal field of life. And the fields may be different, but the work is the same. And Lord, our response to you is yes. We pray that you would um, raise up laborers in this time. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.